सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली फॉर दस्ट ईयर लॉट ऑन इंडिया पॉपुलेशन चाइना पॉपुलेशन it's generally presumed globally by the un who and others although who will talk about it in a minute uh, by all the all the global agencies that india's population this year if not this month if not this financial year maybe by the end of 2023 will become bigger than china so india will become the most populous country in the world that is the wide belief the only way the only way to prove whether this belief is right or wrong is for india to hold a census if india had held its census in 2021 okay that was a covid year if we had done it in 2022 we would have, we would have known the exact number or nearly exact number but we don't have it so we have to look at what is being done by international agencies so the idea that india will become a more populous nation than china is now widely accepted the idea also that china's population is declining very fast is widely accepted it's also that china is now walking into a into a demographic trap is also accepted what is not fully understood as yet is that while india's population growth rate is also declining rapidly in fact it's declining much faster than most most than most people give us the credit for it in fact we are ourselves to blame for this because within our own country our population discourse is so distorted in terms of religions regions etc etc that we are not that not we are not willing to congratulate ourselves we've done a fantastic job of population control in a purely democratic system with no coercion i will come to that also because we need data for all that if you look at all that you also see that india is not about to lose its demographic dividend soon and now we have data also showing how long will this last and again again to remind us in india that this is an opportunity for, for us to lose because china our main competitor way ahead of us okay all right we might be becoming more populous populous than them while having a much smaller land mass than them but at the same time they are really growing old right now so to give you one basic fact our average age now is 28 china's is 39 39 america's is 38 so china is in fact older than america and china is getting older faster than america again you may ask me why one of the reasons is that america allows a lot of immigration so outsiders come in they become american they produce babies right and younger people mostly people who migrate to america are younger people in search of jobs and opportunities in china no such thing happens china in fact is a net exporter of people just as india is today a net exporter of people not by a lot in india in 2021 we have data now and i will come to it showing that about 3 lakh people net net left india in a year now 3 lakh people leave every year net net it's not going to make a dent on india's population in china the number is a bit more but the fact is i am just using this to contrast it with the fact that america accepts a lot of immigrants every year renews its population also it helps it helps protect america's demographics also america's birth rate uh, birth rates are higher than china's they are still way below say india's and way not even a half of say pakistan's i'm just using a far out example but they are still higher than china so china's at this point net China's fertility rate that is the number of babies an average woman would produce in her reproductive year say between the age of 18 to 49 right in china it's below 1.2 right in america it's 1.6 so it is substantially higher than china's india on the other hand has now come to 2 so india is higher than china almost twice as high as china it is higher than america but 2 2.1 is like replacement level so india's population growth has also come to a replacement level which is very good news the reason we are talking about all of this is that a new pew research has come out you will see stories on this pew research on the print dot in 
and as these come out i'll share a link with you with the description of this of, of this episode of cut the clutter but but this pew research it's looking it's picking up data from where it's picking picking up data from the un from the un bodies uh, from the un population division it's picking up data from who it is picking up data from international sources world bank r2011 census but most importantly the most current data from indian sources comes from national family health survey phase 5 so it picks up data from all that and makes make some very very pertinent and interesting points so i will i will reel out these points to you with some analysis we'll be borrowing seven graphics with gratitude to pew so thank you very much pew for this research and also for this marvelous graphics but these will make us understand the picture a lot better so india uh, pew tells us and this is something that we know has added a billion people to its population since 1950 in fact more than a billion people to its population 1950 india's population as recorded then was 34 5.3 crores right we passed the 135 crore mark some time back now we are 142 or thereabouts so we have added more than a billion people more than a 100 crore people in these in these 72 73 years 2024 as i told you our population is reckoned to be like 1.42 to 1.43 billion again the un then un population division has three ways it applies three variants to assess where or project where your population will be by 2050 2070 2075 2100 until 2100 and see this graphic carefully so the top line is the high median the bottom line is the low median and the middle line obviously is the median median is a more moderate indicator to see if your population grows by this much the high variant is if your annual population growth rate is then up by another 0.5% 0.5% is a lot over a large base of population and the low median is if your annual birth rate comes down by 0.5% i would say if you ask me just going by the record that india has had of the past 30 40 years i would say that reality as india progresses would be a little bit better on the population numbers then even the median projection even the median variant used by the un so if you use the median variant see this graphic even if you use the median vari variant it tells you that india all right so today india has just a little less than twice as many people as all of europe all of europe has 74.4 crore people all of india has already 143 crore people and almost one and a half times as much as all of the americas that is north south central america that's about just over a billion 1.04 billion india is 1.43 billion but if you see these graphic this tells you that india's population using the median variant will increase steadily 2064 then peak at 1.7 billion that is 170 crores and then it will start declining then it will start declining until 2100 but if you use the low, low variant then the decline will begin not in 2064 but the decline will then begin in 2047 that's important look at the second graphic and that's very important the second graphic tells us that today india among the large population countries and important countries has the largest percentage of people below the age of 25 which means india will have a steady supply of working age people for the next 15 20 30 40 years so in india at this point 42.7% of india's population is below the age of 25 50% are in the age of 25 to 64 which is considered to be prime working age so these people are productive they are contributing to the economy and how many indians are above the age of 65 only 7% indians are above the age of 65 in fact in fact if you make a comparison in, for china this number of people above 65 is 14% twice as twice as many as in india in the us it's 18% so i told you i'll talk about 
WHO in a couple of minutes. So this is the point where I come on to WHO because WHO made that modeling calculation of four and a half million or five million or whatever number of Indians dying. So first of all, my cynical response to that is, you know that I never believed that number. And I gave you many reasons for why I did not believe that number. But if you believe that number, WHO, by the way, has not been repeating the num that number since then. But if you believe that number, then are you then saying, are you then not even docking India's population with that 5 million dead and still saying India is overshooting China's population this year? Come se come, agar itne log mar gaye humare, if 5 million of us died, instead of the 6 lakh or something that the that government of India claims or puts out in, in its official figures, then at least thoda sa humko discount de do. Give us a little bit of a discount for these people dead. So maybe we are not such a large population anymore because that many people dying is a significant number. And why is it so? And I know that there's been a lot of counter questioning of my doubts over those WHO numbers that if America had such a high fatality rate, why is India having such a low fatality rate? The answer may lie in the age of India's population. Only 7% of India is above 65. In fact, if you go backwards to 60, again, percentages comparatively between India, America, India, China, India and other developed countries, Italy, Spain, Germany will be very similar. So India has much younger, much younger population. And we know that COVID was much harsher, much more, much more lethal to older people. That out of the way, I told you, we come to our third point. Third point is China and US are aging much faster than India. I told you China 14%, that is twice as many as India are above 65. In the US, 18%. In India, in India, the number of people above the age of 65 will not cross 20% 20, 20 of our population till 2063. So we will remain young for a long time. Again, we will not, this age group will not reach 30% of India's population at least until 2100. So India will stay younger, much longer. In fact, in India, at least, if you see this graphic now, this graphic makes it very clear. In India, at least till 2078, the population under 25, that is young Indians below the age of 25, will be more than Indians above the age of 65. That's a very positive, positive demographic. And again, age group of 25 to 64, which is a productive age group. Today, today, 49.8% Indians are in that age group. Even in 2100, 46.3% Indians will be in that age group. So India will, even in 2100, even if population grows according to this median variant, India will still have almost half the people in very productive working age groups. Next point. Next point is fertility rate. Point number four, fertility rate tells you how far is the population growing. So India, as I told you, is 2% today. 2% is higher than China, which is just shy of 1.2%. How Chinese wish it was 2%, but they can't. I keep saying it again and again. You can use state power to prevent people from producing more babies. You cannot use state power to force people to produce more babies. America, 1.6%. But remember, India's population growth rate today has declined phenomenally compared to what it was, say, 30 years ago. That is 1992. 1992, India's fertility rate, that is number of babies a woman produced in her reproductive years, age 18 to 49 was 3.4 and by the way it began with 6 in 1950. Now look at this graphic, very interesting graphic and this graphic tells you what has happened to India's populations, population growth in terms of religion. So there is a general view that minorities are growing much faster in India than Hindus, particularly Muslim minorities growing much faster than Hindus. Now it is true, this data tells us it is true that the Muslim population in India had a much higher birth rate than Hindu population. But that has changed dramatically. So if you go 30 years back, if you look at this graphic, this graphic starts, data starts with 1992. 1992, for all women in India, fertility rate was 3.4. That is 10 women in India produced 34 babies between them. 1992, national average was 3.4. For Muslims, it was 4.4. So that was, so if 10 other women if 10 of all of Indian women, including Muslims, 
produced 34 kids, just 10 Muslim women produced 44 kids. So you could say, yeah, this is a big difference. Today, however, this gap has become much closer. There is a gap. Today, Hindu women, for example, have a rate of 1.9. In 1992, the Hindu women had the rate of 3.3. That is 10 Hindu women produced 33 babies. 10 Muslim women produced 44 babies. Today, 10 Hindu women produced 19 babies and 10 Muslim women produced 24 babies. So it is now 1.9 and 2.4, 1.9 for Hindus, 2.4 for Muslims. So it is still higher, but the gap is reducing. So Muslim population of India is also taking to birth control quite healthily and quite robustly. And we are beginning to see that difference in data. Again, interestingly, look at the other, look at the other minorities, looks at Sikhs, Buddhists and Jains. They are the ones who have the lowest birth rates. In fact, their birth rates now compare with America's birth rates and Sikh birth rates have been lower, have been lower than the rest even since 1992. So in 1992, the Sikh birth rate was 2.4, while the Muslims had 4.4, Hindus had 3.3, national average was 3.4, the Sikhs already had 2.4. Today, they have 1.6 and if you look at Buddhists and Jains, they are also in the same ballpark. So again, very interesting, but maybe, maybe it also has to do with prosperity level of various communities. Then next point, come to point five. This is the heat map of India states. Look at India's population growth by state and this data is based on the census, census, census figures of 2001, 2011. Look at the map. The map is self-explanatory. So I'll let it linger on your screens for some time. You can take you, you can take a close look, particularly of the states you might be interested in. And if you see the dar the darker, the deeper, the deeper orange part of the map is the Hindi heartland, right? The Hindi heartland it is, which has the highest birth rates even now. And if you look at that, and this is remember 2001 to 11 figures, the fastest growing states, the fastest growing states, the fastest growing big state, no surprise is Bihar. That's the case even now. If you look at NFHS, Bihar 25.5% growth in 10 years, that is averaging 2.5% per year, not compounded. Uh, Madhya Pradesh 20.4, Jharkhand 22.4, Chhattisgarh 22.6. The highest of course is Meghalaya 28, which might have something to do with the church influence there, right? But Meghalaya is a very small population, so, so it has a very small base, does not affect national numbers so much. Manipur again had 24%, but see, Rajasthan 21%, UP 20.2%, uh, etc, etc. But if you look at some of the other states, who are the good states on population? Kerala, just check out Kerala, 4.9%. So in a decade, when Bihar grew by 25.4%, Kerala grew by 4.9%, Andhra Pradesh, big surprise, and then it was combined, uh, state had not split. Andhra Pradesh, 11%, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, about 15.6%, Maharashtra, 16%, surprise of surprises, Odisha, which was then a very poor state. It's still a very poor state, but it's not a Bimaru state because they've really worked on their social indicators. 14.1%, Gujarat 19.3%. Very interestingly, Punjab 13.9%. We told you Punjab is doing very well on population. Himachal again 12.9%. JNK on the higher side 23.6% between 2001 and 11. Let us see if there is a census now what the figures tell us. Next, next set of next set of data that is number six. That in urban areas of India, median age at which women produce babies is lower than in rural areas. You might say yes, that makes sense, but data always helps. So Pew tells us that in urban areas, the median age at which a woman has a baby is 22.3 years. In rural areas, it's 20.8 years. Whereas for women who have had 12 years or more of schooling, which means women who passed higher secondary school, 10 plus 2, just ne pass kiya hai. For them, the median age of delivering a baby is 24.9. Again, stands to reason. And for women who have had no school, schooling at all, the median age at which they produce a baby is 19.9. So once again, you see how social indicators are linked to population growth. Again, if you look at women in the highest wealth quintile, then the median age for producing a baby or motherhood is 23.2. In the lowest quintile, it is 20.3, which brings us to point number seven. Point number seven, again, is a good news story for India, gender balance. 
Now, if you see this graphic, it's a very telling graphic. So in the graphic starts in 1960. In 1960, you can see that sex imbalance at birth is almost negligible. That is 105 boys to 100 girls. That is seen to be more or less normal or natural, right? Then what happens? 1971, India makes abortion legal, right? So see that landmark. India makes abortion legal. Already this imbalance is rising, but 1971, as India makes abortion legal, this imbalance begins to rise faster. 19, early 1980s, ultrasound comes in. And as ultrasound comes in, then sex determination of fetus becomes possible. As that happens, this imbalance really shoots up like this. This graph really takes off. Ultimately, in 2010 or so, this graph peaks. This graph peaks at about 111.2. And then you see all these new laws come in, controls over ultrasound examination or ultrasound gender testing, sex selection comes in and then awareness comes in. And now this has begun to decline. So what was 111.2, the peak in 2010, then declined to 109, has now declined to 108 and is on a declining trend quite consistently. In fact, I will share with you also the graphic on China. So see this graphic on China. This tells you how gender imba imbalance or sex imbalance in China has been much, much worse. Because what happened? They enforced a one-child norm. So when they enforced a one-child norm, then parents really did start killing their daughters or not look, looking after their daughters. So they at one point had the imbalance of 118 to 100. That might have corrected a little bit once they permitted people to have a second child, but their gender imbalance is still worse, much worse than India's. Once again, dictators don't know how people's family lives work, but they still want to mess with people's family lives. Again, again, number eight, I don't have a graphic for this. Number eight, again, is a good news story for India that infant mortality rate in India has really improved, which means it has really declined. So infant mortality rate, mortality rate in India, which in 1990 was 89 per thousand, in 2020 was 27 per thousand. So you might say great improvement, indeed great improvement, but it is still not as, as good as it should have been because, because our neighboring countries, some of our neighboring countries are doing much better. Bangladesh is 24, Nepal is 24, Bhutan is 23, Sri Lanka is six, China is six, and by the way, US is five. So there's, so there's a long way to go. If Sri Lanka can get to six, so can India, but because if you cut down infant mortality rate, it brings you many other benefits in its way. But the, again, the good news is Pew tells us that the UN Interagency Group for Child Mortality Estimation, that tells us that every year there is a drop between 0.1% to 0.5% in infant mortality rate in India. Of course, we wish that they should be faster and hopefully this will be faster as India modernizes, infrastructure picks up, and also awareness picks up. Next point, of course, I told you that India has negative ne negative immigration. Now that is that's a notional point. That is not such an important important point in numbers, but it's an important point politically because there are lots of people in India, Indian politics, particularly on the right, who think that India is being invaded by outsiders, and that is what is swelling up India's population. Although Pew tells us that they've been junctures in the 20th century when India took a lot of immigrants. One of those might have been 1971 during the, during the Bangladesh crisis when a lot of refugees came to India and at some other points of time also people came in. After 65 war, a lot of the Hindus came in, for example. But that besides, at this point, <laughs> last many years, India is a net exporter of people. It's not as if outsiders are coming in and filling up our population. So we have to stop being neurotic about those things. One, we should stop being neurotic about too many babies being produced. Second, we should simply stop getting so apoplectic about Muslims producing too many more babies and overwhelming the rest. They are still producing a few more babies than the Hindus, but their birth rates are declining very fast as well. So the movement is in the right direction. So give up these fears of being overwhelmed. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry if I disappoint. disappoint one constituency, but I'm not giving you my view. I'm only speaking data for you. And this is not my data. This is data from all the top international agencies. So I must also acknowledge the three authors of this report. This is Laura Silver, 
Christine Huang and Laura Clancy, thank you very much and thank you very much Pew for the data and research analysis and also for graphics. And now I gave you one comparison with China in the passing on skewed sex ratios and I had mentioned the graphic to you. So we showed you the graphic then, I bring back the graphic now, right? See the graphic on your screen. See how China's gender imbalance or sex ratio has progressed, right? There's a point when they bring in the one child child policy, when it's about 107 boys to 100 girls, that is considered close to normal, right? The moment they enforce a one child policy, it goes up to 118. By 2000, 118. In 20 years, what was a sex ratio of 107 to 100 became 118 to 100. Then they said, all right, two children, right? They allowed two children. Then they said, all right, three children, right? With all of that, it's now come to 112. So that's one more demographic besides the average age, besides the youthfulness of the population where India has done much better than China. So while, while we rue all the, all the wrong things we've done, all the mistakes we've made, we should, we should also congratulate ourselves for a few things that we have done better. In fact, if you look at Chinese population now, they are rapidly aging. So see this graphic as well. This is from Pew's report, 2022 report on China. If you see this graphic, it tells you that by 2035, 30% of China's people will be 60% and older. Today, 20% are 60% and older. By 2035, 30% will be 60 will be 60 years and older that will make for 40 crore people so india also has demographic advantages everything is not negative by 2100 if you look at this pew data china's dependency ratio that is number of people who depend compared to number of people who earn will become will go in the negative territory that means fewer people will be earning than the number of people who will be depending on their income. So who are the people who are considered as not earning? That is people between the age of 0 to 14, they are children, and also in the age of 65 plus bracket. I'm not saying nobody above 65 works, but generally that is a safe presumption to make. In fact, in fact, if you look at this Pew data, it tells you that by 2079, you don't have to, the Chinese don't have to wait till 2100. By 2079 itself, China's dependency ratio would have gone to the other side.